and we are live. And we are live once again. Welcome everyone to today's uh, episode of The Parlor. We have sound. Hopefully. Let me make sure. Yeah. Let me make sure my voice is coming through. And it's not. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is. My voice is coming through. Good. Good. Now, so now we don't have doing... any technical difficulties. We don't have any technical difficulties, and we're doing chapter 38 of The Spake Zarathustra, Scholars. I'll put that into the chat as soon as I'm able to. Yeah, it is. When I lay asleep, then did a sheep eat at the ivy wreath on my head. It ate and said thereby, Zarathustra is no longer a scholar. <laughs> an ivy wreath on the head is an honorific. Or not an honorific, I'm sorry. It's sort of a status symbol. This person has a particular status. So a sheep that is a, uh, you know, you've heard the overworked phrase sheeple. A sheep comes along, or a person very much like a sheep, rips off the ivy wreath and says, Zarathustra is not a scholar because he doesn't have an ivy wreath or a degree from an ivy league. It said this and went away clumsy and proudly. A child told it to me. So they did this while Zarathustra was asleep, and then a little kid came running up to him. Zarathustra, Zarathustra, a sheep, a tribe, wreath, and then it said you weren't a scholar. <laughs> wow. I like to lie here where the children play, beside the ruined wall, among thistles and red poppies. A scholar am I still to the children and also to the thistles and red poppies. Innocent are they even in their wickedness. But to the sheep I am no longer a scholar, so willeth my lot. Blessings upon it. So, yeah, they, if you don't think I'm a scholar, well, good, you can sit on it and spin. And why does he react that way? Well, you understand that... Nietzsche wrote some stuff that was intended for educational purposes once upon a time. And one critic said something about him. I'll paraphrase it because I can't remember it exactly. He should gather lions and tigers around him, but not the youth of Germany. The point being that he was uh, far too dangerous and unstable and uh, far too dangerous and unstable and wild of a person and too excitable and perhaps juvenile to, uh, you, you know, he's out there. He shouldn't be gathering the youth of Germany. And then he gives Zarathustra a serpent and an eagle around him as if to say, oh, yes, wild animals are quite appropriate for me, for I am a wild beast. Which is another way to say fuck you to all the people who doubted him. For this is the truth. I have departed from the house of the scholars, and the door have I also slammed behind me. Good fucking riddance. Too long did my soul sit hungry at their table. Not like them have I got the knack of investigating, as the knack of nutcracking. So... What he's saying is, is he's not a problem solver. He's not a bean counter. He's not a guy who finds a little walnut and dedicates immense effort to cracking it so he can get the nut out and then put it, place it carefully in the nut bowl for his collection. That's not, that ain't Zarathustra, that ain't Nietzsche. Freedom do I love in the air over fresh soil. Rather would I sleep on ox skins than on their honors and dignities. 
air over fresh soil. What is what are the significance of those words? Because Nietzsche does not waste any words ever. Air over fresh soil. Fresh soil has a particular smell. It smells very strongly of, well, dirt air over fresh soil he would prefer the smell of fresh earth the smell of dirt and freedom and he would rather sleep on ox skins like a nomad like a heathen like a barbarian yes than ox on skins the... are not particularly plush or fine they're very coarse and bothersome and so on because i would what he's saying basically is i would rather crawl over a bed of hot coals and glass and heroin needles with my fly open than talk to you fucking people for one more minute. Or rather, I, am I would, I, or rather, not, not even, not even just talking, but even, even, uh, accepting a wreath from a sheep. You can keep that shit. Exactly. Even if even if a sheep were to attempt to bestow the wreath back onto Zarathustra's head, he wouldn't take it from a sheep. Yeah. Harsh words. He doesn't think that they're worthy of any kind of intellectual... Like, they're not worthy to bestow intellectual honors. Anything worth... Or anything that they bestow would be no more worthy than them, in a sense. It's like, would you really want a, a not a, someone who's not particularly discerning to go and say, oh, this person is discerning? It's like having an idiot go and say you're smart. Yeah, that really means a lot. Right. And he's not interested in getting honor from sheep. I am too hot and scorched with mine own thought. Now, whenever he uses hot and cold, cold being something of the spirit and the intellect, and heat being something of the will, so why would it be hot with his own thought? Perhaps because it is willfully driven thought. Often it is ready to take away my breath. Then I have to go into the open air and away from all dusty rooms. Be be because... Basically, there was nothing for there for him to feed on. There's nothing there for no air for him to breathe. And this his thought, this sort of passionate willed thought, was not welcome in a place like that because. But they sit cool in the cool shade. They want in everything to be merely spectators, and they avoid sitting where the sun burneth on the steps. Like those who stand in the street and gape at passers by. Thus do they also wait and gape at the thoughts which others have thought. Should one lay a hold of them, then do they raise a dust like flower sacks and involuntarily. But who would divine that their dust came from corn and from the yellow delight of the summer fields? So these people are so, basically so fucking boring. That if you lay a hand on them, dust comes up. Corn dust, no less. Because these guys are herbivores. They are not hunters nor meat eaters. This is dust from corn. And corn is a crop that has been cultivated. Corn, as such, does not grow wild. And one feeds livestock with it. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's... Because these guys are sheep. And they're, they, they are sheep. They eat food that is incredibly inexpensive to make. It's... It has relatively low nutrient value. It's mass produced very near where you live. I can drive 10 minutes and be in a cornfield, a big one. And that's, you know, great, a great deal of the Midwest is that way. You can find cornfields all over the place. It's, uh, yeah, not particularly a prized possession. And if you're going to go and feed yourself with nothing but corn, well, you're going to wind up being unhealthy. 
And so if you wind up having a bunch of people that literally, I mean, that that's literally the processed food of Nietzsche's day. Cornmeal, corn flour, corn stuff. That's, you know, it's, it's, ugh. Just not at all substantive. Made sure that everything is completely uniform. Have you ever seen a cornfield? If you haven't seen a cornfield, go take They're a picture. They're always planted in rows. Always planted in perfect rows, going as far as the eye can see often. And every single ear is about that big when you harvest it. And... Yeah, it's just ugh, it's stifling. He's he's trying to get at the idea that these people want so much to, you know, crack open a nut, put the nut into the bowl. The nut does not go anywhere other than the bowl. Have the field with corn. The field does not contain anything other than corn. We will go and we will consume corn for the rest of our lives. It's just so enamored with routine and safety, that they're unwilling to be investigative, which is supposedly their job as scholars. And more to the point, more to the point, these people are only scholars by virtue of the laurel wreath the olive wreath on their forehead or on their head. They're not scholars in any other means. In fact, you could go as far as to say that it's as if you wrote scholar on a dunce cap, which incidentally was originally a scholar thing from Dun Scotus, but I digress. Write scholar on a dunce cap, like a little paper hat, and put it on their heads, it would amount to the same thing. And this has gotten much worse in the past century with the inflation of college degrees. Um, so now it's not even like the the uh, modestly clever turnkeys who have degrees. It's just everybody. Yeah, I mean, it's. do you know how easy it is to get a degree in agricultural engineering? You can go and call yourself an engineer. Even though you're not. Right. Mm-hmm. When they give themselves out as wise, then do their petty sayings and truths chill me. In their wisdom, there is often an odor as if it came from the swamp. And verily, I have even heard the frog croak in it. Now, what are frogs, Nietzsche? He he brings up frogs many times as a metaphor. And, well, if you think about it, I guess uh, this little slimy creature that sits in a swamp and just croaks. And some of them are poisonous. But mostly just little slimy creatures that sit around and croak. And the swamp for Nietzsche, I think, was the academy. Clever are they. They have dexterous fingers. What doth my simplicity pretend to beside their multiplicity? So not besides, but beside. Beside their multiplicity, what does his simplicity pretend to? Well, that sounds very much like what we refer to today as performing mental gymnastics. They are able to deal with their cognitive dissonance by performing mental gymnastics or weaving a web of lies or half-truths or truisms or uh, sayings regurgitated from history that they're somehow reciting without actually knowing what it is that they're reciting. They, 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 they fabricate their reality with all this stuff, and they don't actually care about what 
reality actually is because they're essentially too afraid. They're sheep. Sheep startle easily. They're herd animals and prone to getting themselves into bad situations. So clearly the only fabrications that they're going to be making are going to be the ones that allow them to feel safe in the world, even though the world may not be a safe place. As long as, as long as I got my cornfield, as long as I got my cornflower, as long as I got my, my web, I'm going to be okay. I'll be okay. It doesn't matter what Nietzsche says. It doesn't matter what anybody does. It doesn't matter if the world goes to hell in 40 years. I'll be okay. All threading and knitting and weaving do their fingers understand. Thus do they make the hose of the spirit. And I think what he's taking a shot at here are the sort of, uh, let's say, the sort of Baroque specialists. Baroque in the old sense, a word meaning excessively ornate and intricate and detailed. All threading and... Threading and knitting and weaving. Do their fingers understand? Thus do they make the hose of the spirit. The hose meaning the pants. So, the clothing of the spirit. Well, the pants specifically because, well... You could wear a tunic, for example. You can wear something like that and it works, but the, but the, but, but the hose specifically cover the lower body. Oh. And the idea is that these sort of Baroque specialists that manufacture these these endless, th this endless stream of work based around dissecting some sub, 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 sub point of some field. And that's more or less what they do. They're like little spiders weaving these webs that are intricate, Baroque, ornate, yes. But not substantive. Right. Good clockworks are they. Only be careful to wind them up properly. Then do they thereby indicate the hour without mistake and make a modest noise thereby. So they can be quite productive if uh, they're like a wind-up toy. Wind it up and make sure it's pointed in the right direction and let it go, and it will dutifully march in that direction, which is what these things are. So one step, you know, at the very bottom, you have the dumbass who has to be hit with a whip in order to keep him doing anything or get him to do anything right. And then one tiny baby step above that guy, there's these people who are like wind-up toys. And millstones. Like millstones do they work, and like pestles throw only seed corn unto them. They know well how to grind corn small and make white dust out of it. And these people, uh, are, so Nietzsche is, I, I think maybe a good way to summarize it is scholars who are small-souled. They have no desire to tackle anything great. They have no desire to tackle anything significant. They want to, well, in today's world, they want to get tenure by being the world's leading expert on, I don't know, the one particular sentence of Kant, and not understanding it in its context, but just draw a distinction give it an acronym, and you're done. Yes, and then you can go and fill the requisite, I don't know, depends on how much you need for a PhD, I guess anywhere from 60 to 300 pages with a bunch of ill-conceived BS that nobody's ever going to bother to question because, well, they did it too.
They keep a sharp eye on one another and do not trust each other the best. Of course not. They're ingenious in little artifices. They wait for those whose knowledge walketh on lame feet. Like spiders do they wait. Oh, hey, there I wa- there it was. I did not read this beforehand. <laughs> um, like spiders do they wait. They keep a sharp eye on one another. Because if you want to know what backstabbing, uh, circle jerking, sucking off your superior, sucking up, uh, being a sycophant, politics, petty disputes, neuroticism, if you want to see an absolute rat's nest of that kind of stuff, stop by a humanities department in any field at the nearest university. If you want to talk about a bunch of bourgeois pen pushers with starched collars who are really, really good at the same kind of petty office politics you find with mid-level managers in an HR department at a large company, but are a lot harder to fire, these guys. Like spiders, do they wait? You can also find them waiting behind, like, one of the shelves at a Whole Foods store. Yes. <laughs> Jacob Froelich says, It's so easy for an intelligent person with a genuine intellectual interest and a desire to seek truth to become one of these wind-up dolls. Just finished a full class day at university with them. Oh, oh yes. Although I, 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 and I have seen people, I, I'm convinced that the the system of education, of graduates education specifically, filters out anybody who could do any good because they head for the hills, and if they don't, they become an adjunct because everybody else feels threatened. And academia is all about you know the dick sucking and prestige and I'm king monkey sort of thing. Well, it's not completely ubiquitous, but th- but that is a trend that you tend to see that 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 the the best wind up getting relegated to adjunct positions because they don't play the games or they go and do very very well in industry. Right. And, oh, by the way, this does not apply to physics majors. You get a major in physics, an undergrad major in physics, and you will get accepted into pretty much any grad program you desire. And you will, especially if you continue in physics or something quantitative, you will have good job prospects if you dare look outside the realm of physics once you're done. Don't get, But don't get the idea that you're going to be able to spend the rest of your life in an ivory tower because that ain't going to happen. No. The ivory tower is inhabited by wind-up toys and spiders. But if you want to be an investment banker, get a degree in physics. You want to be making the millions? Get a degree in physics or engineering. Or I science. saw them always prepare their poison with precaution. And always did they put glass gloves on their fingers in doing so. What is their poison? Is it part of all this politicking and waiting to bite each other, these little spiders? I would say so. Yes, yes, yes. And glass gloves. Why glass gloves? That part's throwing me for a loop. What do you think? Well, if you are putting glass gloves on your fingers, I don't know if it's necessarily gloves made of glass, but gloves that one would wear while lifting a glass you know very, you know uh, something that will a get rid of any fingerprints that you might make you won't you won't leave your own mark on it you'll just you know you'll you, you'll you'll be the poisoner and you'll leave without a trace and somebody that you don't like is going to wind up getting thrown under the bus like you'll be able to get away with impunity because everyone's complicit. I mean, who knows? It might not even be your poison. Somebody else might have decided to poison him instead. Of course, now with Twitter, it's pretty easy to go and trace things back to their original source. But all it takes is one little 
one little rumor to start up and you can go and ruin somebody's reputation. You could do it back then too. It just took a little while longer. But no one had to know where it started. It was probably some dinner party on Tuesday night. Breeding grounds of these sorts. I mean, I wound up having a bunch of leftist professors that got together on Tuesday night to drink and and plan how they were going to screw me. And that was me as an undergrad. We are... They know also know how to play with false dice. And so eagerly did I find them playing that they perspired thereby. With false dice. Weighted dice, I think, is what he means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fabricating reality. So, like, if, if, if reality would have you get a particular distribution <clears throat> that is, that is you know, a normal distribution centered around, say, seven for rolling two dice or what have you. And then have, and, and, and not knowing exactly what you would get on any given die roll. You are generating a more predictable but less representative um, result by weighting the dice. You're not allowing things to take their natural course. Now, of course, there's nothing wrong with doing that per se, but if you're supposed to be an investigative type and you go and adulterate the evidence with your interpretation, or you in some way are intellectually dishonest, I would say that's what that generally works its way out to being on a more abstract level. That would be what it, I would think it represents. And when I lived with them, then did I live above them. Therefore, did they take a dislike to me? Uh oh, somebody's a tall poppy. And these are the poppy choppers cutting down the tall poppies. They want to hear nothing of anyone walking above their heads. And so they put wood and earth and rubbish betwixt me and their heads. Wood and earth and rubbish. Artificial stuff. And crap. Yes. So they put bullshit over their head. Thus did they deafen the sound of my tread. And least have I hitherto been heard by the most learned. And then, you know, 50 to 100 years later, these people are lining up to suck his dick. Well, of course, because... At that point, it's kind of difficult to deny that he saw coming what a lot of uh, the Academy didn't. I mean, he was perceptive. Very, very perceptive. All... Mankind's faults and weaknesses did they put betwixt themselves and me. They call it false ceiling in their houses. False ceiling. Why do they call it false ceiling? Well, it's what you put in between or, or, to, or to hide the rafters. Ah. And hide the roof. So, you know, if you, if you have a, an eight-foot ceiling... On a single floor house, and then you have a little bit of a crawl space in an attic above it, and you, then you just kind of go stuff that with stuff to prevent, you know, if if Nietzsche is out on the roof, or Nietzsche is, I don't know, maybe a rain cloud that's pouring rain on their party or whatever, they don't want to hear the dripping, right, etc. Just insert metaphor there, but the whole point is that Nietzsche is essentially saying I'm. I'm smarter than you. I'm more perceptive than you. I know what's going on, and all you do is want to grind and munch on corn. Uh, so, obviously, I'm going to be causing you cognitive dissonance. So, 
all you're going to wind up doing is taking away my wreath, trying to discredit me as a scholar, and then just avoid listening to what I have to say because you just can't take it. Poppy choppers. Just general, basic poppy chopping behavior. Nothing unusual there and definitely nothing new under the sun. And there is an expression, uh, defensive stupidity, where someone, if they don't want to hear something, will allow themselves to be as stupid as they can. So when he says all mankind's faults and weaknesses, did they put betwixt themselves and me? What he's saying is that they willingly allowed their own judgment to be clouded by whatever faults they had to avoid seeing him. Well, yeah, people will do a lot to avoid cognitive dissonance. People do a great deal. But why would they acknowledge the roof as being false? <coughs> Jacob Froelich. That's an excellent question. Well, they just acknowledge it as being an insulative, having an insulative effect. False ceiling is an insulative ceiling. So, yeah. What they're saying is, is oh, well, you know, all this stuff we say about him is really to keep his ideas out because they're very objectionable. He should gather lions and tigers around him, not the youth of Germany. Exactly. Exactly. It's not that he's they're, that they're necessarily saying that my idea is false, but just that it's 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 insulative. But nevertheless, I walk with my thoughts above their heads. And even should I walk on mine own errors, still would I be above them in their heads. For men are not equal, so speaketh justice. And what I will, they may not will. Thus spoke Zarathustra, meaning may in that sense meaning cannot will. Indeed. Well, um, so let's discuss that a little bit before we go, at least. And we'll be back at 20 minutes after we go, of course, with the next chapter, Poets, whom I suspect Nietzsche will be somewhat more kind to. But you say you wanted to discuss it? Yeah, so... What Nietzsche is doing here is basically he spent years, he was a philologist, he spent years in the academy, and right now what Zarathustra, his proxy, is doing is walking up to the university, dropping trowel, squatting down, and sticking out a great big, uh, let, let's call it a Berlin steamer, all over the university. Yeah. Perhaps, uh, given given the dominance of Kantian thought at the time, a, a, a Königsberg steamer. <laughs> I don't have anything more to add to that, Caleb. I really don't. There's not much else to say. This is just Nietzsche pointing out what is blindingly obvious to anyone who has spent any time around academics is that they're clockwork men. I mean, I think there is a popular image or maybe perhaps manufactured largely by universities themselves of academics as these, uh, you know, these lightning intellects and sort of the mind of the civilization, <laughs> the, the, neuron, the neurons to the rest of, uh, if, if, if society is a body, they're the neurons, the nerve cells and and the neurons in the brain and so forth. I wonder if and they're the nerves. Well, they could be the neurons in the colon. You know, the, the enteric yeah. nervous system. Yes. And what Nietzsche is saying is, no, these guys are a bunch of fucking beam counters. And it's true, you know, if you go to a university, you'll see a lot of what uh, Herman Hess referred to as what he, what he was disgusted by and what he calls in Steppenwolf a complacent bourgeois healthiness. And I think I'm just going to let it go right there. So 34 minutes in, kind of a short one, but it was short and sweet. Or perhaps shit-tasting. That's all <laughs> that we have for now. 
Until next time.